don't really want to make this episode, okay? It's a lot more fun to talk about why they might win the Super Bowl, why they will. That's coming tomorrow, but yeah, we still gotta do this, okay? Don't be like that. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Martin Time Bruiser. I'm your host, John Delray. Yeah, today diving into why this version of the Green Bay Packers may fall short again this year of ultimately winning the Super Bowl. I got a bunch of different reasons for you and things we're going to explore. Some that are very data driven, others that are just things that we've seen have bucked the trend and cost them individual games before. And if they continue on that path, it may cost them more individual games at the wrong time. And those can be season enders. So we're going to go through it all today. Before tomorrow, we do actually get two reasons why they win. Might, might win. There we go. Might win the Super Bowl. But before we get to that, though, uh, just a couple little bits of news since I saw you yesterday. And first, it says on there officially retired. Turns out that's not like a million percent true. But Randall Cobb has accepted a job with the SEC Network to be part of uh, like their broadcast teams, their panels, stuff like that. He's moving on with his broadcasting career. And I got to say, first of all, I think Randall Cobb is going to be fantastic as a broadcaster. Now, when this was originally reported this morning by NFL Network, Ian Rappaport, Mike Garofolo, they basically said like, he's retired, he's taking this job. And then Cobb himself came out and said, whoa, 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 not officially retired, just beginning this if an nfl team still calls like i'll still do that so i keep that in mind i mean randall cobb now it appearing at the very least to be getting himself into pseudo retirement taking this broadcasting gig but keeping the door cracked ever so slightly for a return to the nfl but randall cobb fifth on the all-time uh catch list for the green bay packers anytime you're fifth in anything for the packers in a hundred year history You've done something right. He made the 2014 Pro Bowl. He's up near top 10 in receiving yards, receiving touchdowns. This guy was a great Packer for a long time. And I know the end of his tenure, you know, after spending 10 years with Green Bay, a couple years off there in the middle, but he ended his career 10 years in Green Bay in the last couple of years. We certainly saw a different version of Randall Cobb than when he was winning his prime. But when he was in this prime, he was a special player, someone who certainly is going to be going into the Packers Hall of Fame just a few years after his retirement, pseudo calling it quits today. And then one other piece of news for you, since training camp does begin on Monday, the Packers now have put out who is going to be starting training camp on the physically unable to perform list, as well as the non-football injury list. And it's basically five total individuals. For the pup, that's Zach Tom, not shocking at all with his pec injury. Tucker Kraft, not shocking at all with his pec injury. And then Alex Magoo, after suffering that injury back at OTAs, not really surprising, Donovan Jennings, an injury as well. So those are the four individuals that are going to start on the pup list. Keep in mind for camp, they can be activated at any time. Then on the non-football injury list would be uh, day three draft pick Keaton Aladapo. Yeah, the one I'm excited about, the one that I'm really excited to go see play. He's hurt. He's still recovering from that toe injury that he suffered uh, as he was prepping for the draft process and everything. I've seen some stuff speculating that maybe it hasn't healed right. I haven't heard anything concrete in that regard, nonetheless, but he is on the NFI list. It's non-football injury because it didn't happen for the Packers. So yeah, it was still football related injury just before he was a Packer. So they still get to put him on the NFI list. Again, can be activated pretty much whenever. So when he is good to go, we will see at camp. Same deal with all five of these guys. Okay, so let's dive into this. I got a bunch of reasons for you now why the Green Bay Packers may not win this year's Super Bowl. And I'm going to say right at the forefront here, some of these are data light. Others of them are very numerically based. Others, data light. They're things that have led to downfalls before for Green Bay. And if they're not corrected, could lead to a downfall again. Others are just logical trains of thought, right? And then the other thing is, I'm kind of ignoring the overall schematic change that's coming. So I do look back at 2023 a bunch, but if there was something that was like, a reason on here isn't, they play way too freaking soft a zone. 
Well, that's probably not going to be the case under Halfling, so I didn't include it in this list. So I'm ignoring anything that is a potential schematic change on the defensive side of the ball because, frankly, we just don't know enough to speak educatedly, and we could point to any number of things from Joe Barry's defense. The only defensive things that are on here are pretty concrete, regardless of whatever scheme you play. Also, speaking of training camp, I've already gotten a couple suggestions. If, because I'm going to be going live after nearly every single training camp practice, if you want me while I'm there every single day to look for something specific for you, let's use the fact that we're still a smallish channel to our advantage. If you want me to look for something just for you, just put it in the comments. And then as I'm live every day, I'll report back on it for you. I could be like your personal little reporter. You just got to tell me what you want me to look for. So put it in the comments. I'll be happy to help. All right, so let's get into it. Reason number one, that the Green Bay Packers will not win this year's Super Bowl. And again, these are hypotheticals. I don't hate the Packers. I just gonna feel the need to say it a lot. Number one, isn't it possible that we've already seen the ceilings of some of these young guys? Now, I said some of these are data light, and th we're starting off the bat with one. But like, let's just listen to this stroll of names, right? Romeo Dobbs. Is it possible that we've already seen Romeo Dobbs play as well as maybe his ceiling will indicate in the NFL? Yeah, he was only a second year receiver last year, but he became the ultra-reliable Jordan Love option. Is there that much room for growth beyond that? Whether you think there is or not, it at least is a warranted question given the way that he's played and the way that they've used him over the last year. Okay, how about even in some ways Jaden Reed? Now that one may feel insane to say. But think of what Jaden Reed's usage was last year, already taking the occasional handoff, him gutting out a number of touchdowns receiving. So again, like, will he, does he have room to get better? Yeah, absolutely. But these are hypotheticals, right? It at least is in the realm of possibility that the Jaden Reed we saw last year is kind of the Jaden Reed. He's comped to Randall Cobb a lot, right? Well, even Randall Cobb making a Pro Bowl wasn't that different of a player than the sparks that we saw his rookie year. See where I'm getting at here? Sure, there's still room for growth, but it's still like the same guy, not levels different than we saw his rookie. So isn't Jaden Reed possibly in that convo? Or how about left tackle Rasheed Walker? Have we seen the best from Walker that he might play? And if we have, is that good enough? Right? Josh Meyer, Sean Ryan, let's can say that they continue to be inconsistent at best as the interior of the line fall apart. So this one may feel very broad, but there's this mass assumption right now that the Green Bay Packers are such a young team, every single one of the young guys is just going to take a step forward, and thus, the whole team is going to take this step forward. But let's say that they don't. Let's say for a number of the guys, they've already tapped out. They've already reached as well as they can possibly play. Doesn't that mean the team is already about where it can go? Just a logical train of thought on that one. Let's go to number two. Yeah, the schedule. Now, I'm not talking about the whole schedule, but look at that post buy area right there. Week 11, starting off at the Bears. Yeah, no, I'm not worried about that one. But then 12, Frisco. 13, Miami on Thanksgiving, 14 at Detroit, 15 at Seattle. They've lost their last three games in Seattle. And then 16, Monday against New Orleans, 17 against Minnesota, lost two of the last three in Minnesota. And then 18, finishing out against the Bears. By the way, no, I don't love facing a really young Bears team. Am I worried about the Bears? No, but I probably would face them earlier in the season rather than the later as the rookie quarterback maybe gets some footing under him. So there you go, two late season matchups against the Bears, the Niners, the Dolphins, the Lions, the Seahawks, the Saints, and Minnesota in their tougher place to play. It's not the easiest post by slate. And realistically, you want younger teams playing their best football as it gets to the postseason. Well, this post by schedule for the Packers may make it difficult for the Packers to really put everything together against what is their tougher slate of opponents in the season now think back to last year right the packers dropped the game against tampa on december 17th then they very narrowly beat the panthers on christmas eve but one of the reasons why the packers went from the doldrums of losing to tampa in humiliating fashion then barely beating the panthers in still kind of humiliating fashion before going on this tear against minnesota and chicago 
One of the things that led them to that was all of a sudden Aaron Jones playing out of his mind, ripping off consecutive game streaks of over 120 yards on the ground that propelled Green Bay, powerhousing them into the postseason. So what it took was one of Green Bay's oldest players, one of their most experienced guys, finally getting healthy, finally syncing up with the offense along with everybody else, and turning on the Jets for what wound up being a pretty historic run of literally running the football. So the thing is, on this year's roster, do they have, if they drop some games, because it's not typical to do what the Packers did last year, where you drop some December games, then all of a sudden just go on this tear. That's not normal. So what I'm saying is, if they don't have a guy like Aaron Jones this year, and they drop a couple in that schedule range, are they going to be spinning their wheels? Or can they do the same kind of ascent that we saw last year? It's logical to think that they might not. And that could lead to their downfall. Speaking of Aaron Jones, let's take a look at his counterpart and say, what if Josh Jacobs isn't able to do what Jones did? See, not only did Aaron Jones propel the offense forward down the stretch, but he was their leader off the field in so many ways too. It's been projected that the Packers are aiming to switch their running game to more of a gap style as opposed to zone this year. But if that doesn't gel as well with the offensive line, if the offensive line still wants to block zone or whatever, and of course Lafleur can adapt as we go, but what if Jacobs can't propel the offense the same way that Jones did when it reached its absolute heights? What if last year's PFF assessment of Jacobs, the fact that he wasn't great independent of his offensive line? I know the easy thing to blame with Jacobs is the fact that the Raiders O-line sucked. But Jacobs didn't exactly run well behind it either. So what if PFF is right when they assert that? And Jacobs isn't as good as what we saw Jones at the end of the year. What happens when this uber young team with meteoric, mountainous expectations placed upon them face a little bit of adversity in the season? And they do not have the calming presence of an Aaron Jones on the offensive side of the ball. Is Jordan Love already that leader? Is Jacobs as strong of a leader as Aaron Jones was? Or do some of the other young receivers step up? It's not something to be taken for granted. And this team now has, like I said, mountainous expectations on them, whereas last year they didn't. So can they overcome adversity while competing with these expectations and is jacobs the guy to help them survive it next up oh little buddy six foot five buddy anders carlson on extra points last year anders carlson was the third worst kicker in the league in terms of field goal percentage he ranked 25th even on kicks over 50 yards which are supposed to be his wheelhouse he was 21st and if you're thinking, well, maybe it won't be Anders' job. Maybe Greg Joseph gets the job. I wouldn't hold my breath that it's going to be all that much better. Because, yeah, Joseph was stronger in a number of regards last year. But if you look over all of Greg Joseph's career, it's not exactly stellar. Two of his five years in the league have extra point percentages under 90% like Anders did last year. And his field goal percent overall last year and the year prior were both worse than Anders last year, too. So, plus, like, wrap that in with the fact that PFF has the Packers ranked at 28th in special teams last year, and Goslin had them 29th. But I, I don't know as if the new rules are even going to help them on special teams. Carlson led the league last year with 47% of his kickoffs returned. Pair that with the Packers ranking ninth worst in the NFL with yards allowed per return, and it doesn't bode well, the fact that these big changes are going to help Green Bay all that much. And if you want to say, well, again, what about Greg Joseph? He could be the great Minnesota hope for our kicking game. Joseph had under half the amount of kicks returned that Carlson had last year. And his hang time was only 0.01 of a second different. See, it's not, it's not even just Anders kickoffs. It's the fact that no team was afraid to return it against Green Bay. And I know Green Bay, there was this stretch where they lead the league in bringing down the, uh, the, the returning team within the 20. They led the league in that for a bit. Well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of easy to get those cumulative stats when you're leading the league in returns against you by a country mile, which they were. So keep that in mind. If the special teams doesn't improve, if Anders Carlson doesn't improve, I know some of you still attribute the loss to San Francisco on little buddy's arms. Kicking can cost you games. There's no doubt about it. And I am pulling for Anders to get better, but if he doesn't, 
it could spell trouble. Next up, turnovers, interceptions, fumbles. Fumbles are fluky, right? We can all admit that. But some players are just more prone to fumbling the ball than others. Marshawn Lloyd, their new rookie running back, yeah, he happens to be one of them. He had a couple last year. Josh Jacobs replacing Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones was never exactly perfect in this regard. Well, Josh Jacobs, also not great. A combined six over the last two years. Even Love struggles with keeping his hands on the ball as PFF credits him with 10 fumbles last year, eighth highest in the NFL for nine running backs. And that's along with his 11 interceptions. Frankly, it just doesn't seem to be that super high of a priority for Brian Gutekunst and company to acquire players that don't fumble. So on a team basis last year, they finished 19th in the NFL with 1.3 fumbles per game. First being the least amount of fumbles. So 19th is the wrong freaking way. 1.3 fumbles per game. But very luckily, they finished only 8th in losing fumbles per game at 0.4 of a fumble per game. So fumbling in and itself is fluky. Recovering fumbles is even more fluky. And last year, the Packers finished 19th in fumbling, but 8th in recovering them? That's weird and statistically anomical. So they were statistically lucky. If they continue to put the ball on the ground as often as they did this year, and they aren't as lucky, that's the kind of thing that can end a game. That's the kind of thing that can end a playoff run. And so between Jacobs, with Lloyd, with Love, it is something that does have to improve because you just can't bank on getting lucky every single year. Now, I said that I wasn't going to talk about defense much, and that's true from a schematical standpoint, right? But think about it this way, okay? I'm not going to put this on a first-year defensive coordinator, but if the defense doesn't work this year, and I and you could say, like, doesn't work, can be vague, can mean anything you want, finish top 10, I wouldn't say top 1, or anything, but like a quality NFL defense, right? Upper half of the NFL even. Let's just get that far. Okay, a Super Bowl capable winning defense. Halfley's defense is projected to be schematically about as far away as Barry's. 4 3 base versus 3 4 base. Backward zones under Barry, aggressive pushing up from Halfley. Read and react D line with Barry versus attack at all costs with Halfley. High blitz levels, but very aggressively neutral under Barry to send the dogs under Halfley. There are two schools of thought that are about as far as you can get away in defensive philosophy, right? So if you change all of that, like you do change some players, yes, but the core of the defense still much the same. So if you change that far schematically, you go from one end of the spectrum to the polar opposite end of the spectrum, and it still doesn't work if the defense can't be in the upper half. I'm not talking about week one, week two, week three, week four, as the defense is learning its way. I'm talking end of the season when it really matters for Super Bowl run. If the defense still can't be good by then, then I think the front office has to look themselves in the mirror and say, the Ron Wolf way, the Ted Thompson way, the Brian Gutekunst way of acquiring defensive players just doesn't work. We've got to blow it up. We have to look at the players that were able to be successful under both schematic principles. Guys would stand out here. We've got to keep them. The rest we have to blow up. See, because the Packers face a unique crossroads here. It's not all that often that you see coordinators come in and run just about as far away from the predecessors you can possibly go. But it's what the Packers are doing this year. And so I continue to say, if it just doesn't work, then it's time for Brian Gutekunst to really look and say, well, there's no, there's no scapegoating anyone anymore. It's not Mike Patton. It's not Joe Barry. Halfley's got the pedigree. Halfley tried the other side. It still didn't work. Eventually, it's on the way that we do things. And this is one that we just don't know yet. And if it doesn't work, it could end the season. Speaking of defense ending the season, this one is schematically independent. Let's just talk about tackling. And oh, I showed Devontae Wyatt there for uh, <clears throat> no particular reason. 
here's one thing, right, that is, it is one of my largest pet peeves on the football field. If you're a regular listener, you know that. But, okay, here are the Packers' missed tackle totals in their nine losses this year. 15, 8, 13, 4, 13, 7, 16, 8, 6. That doesn't even factor in special teams. That's just defense. Now, not every single one of those numbers is problematic. That's missed tackle totals off of every single loss, all nine losses, right? The four really stands out. It's like, you should be able to win a game with four missed tackles. Definitely. And you can certainly win when you're in like the six, seven category. But the num- higher that number goes, the less likely you are to win. And when you have multiple performances of 13 missed tackles, 15, 16, oh, it's real hard to win a football game when your defense can't bring anybody down. When you're up that high in terms of missed tackles, you could pretty much just pencil an L in on the schedule. And if they're timed poorly, like the 15 missed tackle performance against San Francisco in the divisional round, you can kiss your season goodbye. Next up, back to the offensive side of the ball. Let's talk about Jordan Love. And what I'm going to say here is, I'm not going to look at Jordan and be like, well, he's going to regress or anything like that. No, no, because a lot of the data doesn't indicate that that's really likely to happen, to be honest. But I will say, if the Packers assume that Jordan Love is Aaron Rodgers, it could spell trouble. And I mean a couple different things here. One would be like giving him too much offensive control too quickly. He is still only in his second year starting as an NFL quarterback. Or another way, same thing, but a different way, moving back to a glacially paced, run out the play clock every down, just wait and wait and wait type of offense like we saw at the midpoint of the season when everyone was losing their mind and me on watch parties was screaming and topping out the microphone, saying something along the lines of, the kids are young, let them play. If you recall at OTAs, there were lots of headlines about like LeFleur not calling plays. Now they're handing the reins to Jordan Love and Adam Stenovich. And LeFleur assured the media afterwards, like, that's not a normal thing. The regular season, it's going to go back to a standard. But I I like that as an exercise for OTAs, definitely. But you still have to understand that Jordan Love, as good as he was in the back half of last year, is still a second-year starting quarterback and understand the differences between the two quarterbacks that Matt LaFleur has now been the head coach of. Jordan is going to be more daring than Aaron in terms of tight windows and not throwing it away like Aaron did all the time. Aaron ultimately at this point had better accuracy. Certainly from what LaFleur has seen, Aaron had better accuracy than Jordan does on a throw by throw basis. Yes, there are individual throws where Jordan is just absurdly accurate, but on a like throw by throw consistent basis, I think he's still gotta give the nod to Aaron. Jordan also shows that he succeeds the most when playing in tempo, whereas Rodgers not only could excel there, although albeit earlier in his career, but he also excelled at taking every last second, playing chess with the defense and cerebrally attacking their weaknesses. Maybe Jordan will get there. But for now, even as Jordan is in MVP conversations, even as betting odds are looking up like tasty with him, He's still a young quarterback with a howitzer and all the confidence in the world with freakishly athletic, but also freakishly young, still wide receivers. Scheme them open, let Jordan hit them and flourish. If they grow stagnant, if they put too much on him, if they assume that the offense can be run like it used to be run, or they start calling stuff like the midpoint last year, do that at a bad time, season over. Next up, having all number one wide receivers proves to actually be no number one wide receivers. And don't take this the wrong way. I love the Packers receiving core. But, okay, the spontaneity, the unpredictable nature of the offense, the Jordan could just go anywhere at any time, easily should propel them back into being a top five passing offense. But like I talked about yesterday on the live, there is certainly a world of possibility a multiverse out there, if you will, where a fourth and one, fourth and goal, the game is on the line, and you just need 
one guaranteed throw to one wide receiver to make it happen. Back in the day, it used to be Devontae. Before that, maybe Jordy. Right? You can go through the different eras of Packers football, and maybe while there's like a couple guys that maybe ish you think about, but like there's generally one absolute number one who you just knew would get the ball in that second. On this team, I'm not sure who you'd say it is at this point. And realistically, if you do have a confident answer, that's probably your number one. But is it Romeo? Because I think based upon last year, it probably would be. But who do you go to in that second? If the answer truly is anyone, just pick any one of them, then you might as well be answering no one at the same time. Don't get me wrong, I really, really like the way that this team is built. But that lack of a true, guaranteed go-to guy in the absolute most critical moments could potentially prove to be a backbreaker in the playoffs if things go the wrong way. And then the last one. I found this to be very statistically interesting. The Packers finished 17th in the NFL last year in converting red zone opportunities into touchdowns at 53.42%. Now, Over their last three games, when the offense was firing on all cylinders, it jumped to 61%, which would have pushed them all the way up to the eighth. But over the span of the whole season, 53%, 17th in the NFL. And with the questionable kicking game, finishing 17th there could leave a lot of opportunities for points to be left on the board. And there's this next stat does have some like causation correlation things you got to keep in mind here. But just bear with me here. Packers finished 17th at converting red zone into touchdowns. The Packers threw the ball within the 10-yard line. Okay, so not the whole red zone, but within the 10. They threw the ball 55% of their plays. That was 7th highest in the NFL. The only team to finish better than them in terms of like 17th in red zone to touchdowns and through more than them inside the 10 happened to be the Washington red football commandos. They're the only one. The Packers finished 17th, 16 or 15 of those teams all wound up running the ball more inside the 10 than the Green Bay Packers did. The only one who threw it more than the Packers, Washington wasn't even a playoff team. They just happened to be a little bit better at it than Green Bay was. So maybe with Josh Jacobs, that changes. Maybe what we saw at the end of the year, if you could take that and do the 61% thing throughout the whole span of the season, maybe this solves itself. But nonetheless, the way that it stands now when looking just purely at the numbers, it may be a little bit of a mistake by Lafleur to keep throwing at the rate that they are because it just is resulting in bottom half of the NFL red zone converting to touchdown rates. Now, this is not the only stat that will cost you a Super Bowl. The Kansas City Chiefs wound up finishing just behind the Green Bay Packers in this same ranking, and they seem to do fine. But this doesn't help. And when you have, because Kansas City also has a fantastic kicking game, Green Bay doesn't, it leaves a lot of points on the board. And by the way, if you're thinking like, well, at Lambeau, it's better. No, it's actually not because they were only 46% at Lambeau, which was 23rd best at home. Just to throw in that sad little nugget for you. So there you have it. That's it. If you're looking for reasons why, besides the obvious about like injuries and all that kind of crap, of course, I didn't include that. But if you're looking for reasons why the Green Bay Packers may not win this year's Super Bowl, that's a pretty strong collection of them. Let me know if you think I missed any. Let me know if you want me to look for anything at training camp. I'll be back tomorrow with reasons why they will or might win this year's Super Bowl. Thanks so much for joining me. Hope you have a great day. And as always, go Pack Go. (laughs) 